briefly tell me how we met and how we got to know each other very quickly. So Maggie and I met at the beer garden and it's funny, she was with a group of people and I was chatting um, with someone you were with. Mm -hmm. And then you came over and we all started chatting because I was with my dog. So that was how um, the conversation started. And I have a golden doodle and you and Brandon, because Brandon was there too. Brandon was there, yeah. Yeah, you guys had said that you wanted a poodle or a doodle, Mm -hmm. some type of doodle, Mm -hmm. poodle. Yeah, yeah, we were thinking about getting a dog. We had just looked at a dog like last, the last weekend and I had like puppy fever and I saw Ollie and I'm like, who is that? Whose dog is that? I, I need to like know who this dog is. And then, um, then yeah. Yeah. So, and that's not where we exchanged numbers no. though. You started following Ollie's Instagram yes. before you guys left for the next bar mm-hmm. on your pub crawl. And, um, yeah, then you just were always commenting on Ollie's stuff, and I was commenting on your stuff, mm-hmm. so then we just started hanging out. Then we, yeah, that's how we became friends, because of Ollie. Okay, so tell me about your education. Where did you go to school, and how did you get into meteorology? So I'm from New Jersey, and I went to Rutgers um, for meteorology. Not broadcasting. Um, my major is strictly meteorology, so if I didn't want to work in TV, I could do something else. Um, like what? Well, you could work for the National Weather Service. You can work for, um, like in the private sector, forecasting offices who forecast for you know businesses that rely on the weather. Mm-hmm. Um, airports have meteorologists on staff. There's a there's a bunch of like things you don't realize that meteorologists can do. There's forensic meteorologists who you have to get certification for this, but you get your certification and you can essentially testify in court. You know, let's say I fell on your property and I broke my arm and I'm suing you because you didn't shovel. That right. company can have a meteorologist represent them in court saying it did in fact snow on this day and we got six inches of snow. That's, Something along those I lines. I never thought about that. Yeah, That's so, so there's a bunch of so things that you just, the average person doesn't realize. So is this something that you decided to do once you were in school or is this something that you've thought about doing your whole life? As is the case with pretty much all meteorologists, it's usually something you want to do when you're a kid. So for whatever reason, you just have this interest in the weather and it usually originates when you're a child. Um, And that's what happened with me. It can either be like some big weather event that you will always remember that like sparked your interest in meteorology or like for me, it wasn't anything in particular. I just always loved the weather. So I would watch the Weather Channel all the time. I wrote down everybody's name who worked for the Weather Channel and their mm-hmm. title. I knew who everyone was. The severe weather specialist, the winter weather specialist. Stop. I did a lot of my science projects on the weather. Really? I just always loved the weather. But it's funny because I was scared of the wind and I was scared of thunderstorms. Hated really? both. So... What was it, do you have a, a memory of when you were little that were, that defined your interest in weather, or has it just kind of been always something that you It's just always something I in? loved. Really? Yeah, nothing in particular. Mm-hmm. So I found it really interesting when we were first getting to know each other that you didn't study broadcasting, because I think there's this, at least a misconception that maybe I had, that you have to study both in order to be a meteorologist Mm -hmm. on TV. So how did you get into the, like, television broadcast area of meteorology? What brought you that direction? I think a lot of people think that, like, you need a master's to be on TV, but you don't. I just have my undergrad, Mm four-year meteorology degree from Rutgers, and that's it. Really? And since, again, I didn't focus on broadcasting, My major was like all science and math. Mm -hmm. People don't realize the typical meteorology degree in our country requires four years of calculus. So I've taken up to Calc 4. (laughs) It's actually the number one reason why people drop out of the major. Because just the prereqs to get into your Mm -hmm. core meteorology classes, physics one and two, chem one and two, four years of calculus, Mm -hmm. it's a lot. It's really intense or four semesters of calculus, Mm -hmm. I should say, before you can get into the core stuff. But anyways. um, I mean, it makes sense because you're doing all these calculations to predict the forecasts, right? The the thing is, like, 
working in TV and a lot of jobs, it depends on what it depends on what your job is. But I, I do nothing nothing that requires math. Okay. They require all the math because these very complicated computer models that we look at mm-hmm. are derived from these differential equations. Okay. That's okay. where the math comes into play. Okay. But for a TV job, you really don't need the math. So okay. broadcast meteorology majors tend to be watered down compared to just a strictly meteorology, meteorology. major. Okay. It's not as math and science intensive. Okay. So what led you to broadcast meteorology? Was it somebody that you met when you were in school? Was it an internship? Was it... So oh, how, and that's how did the you thing, get, yeah. yeah. So I knew I wanted to do TV ever since I was little. Again, it's just what I always envisioned for myself, watching the Weather Channel mm-hmm. all the time. And then I grew up watching the Today Show, yeah. Al Roker. Mm-hmm. And being from New Jersey, I watched New York City News. Mm-hmm. So I watched, like, Chris Amino all the time. Mm-hmm. I love him. Um, but I... So since I did just meteorology, I really only had one class that focused on television. And then I did on campus, we had like this program where you could, we had a weather studio and you did the weather Mm -hmm. for um, the campus. Mm -hmm. And so I did that once a week. And that was my only chance to be in front of the green wall. And so since I knew I wanted to do TV, it was really important for me to do internships in television because that's the only way I could learn about the industry Mm -hmm being a meteorology major. Mm -hmm. So I did two television internships, one for WABC in New York City Mm -hmm. and one at News 12 New Jersey, along with two other internships. And were those like semester-long internships or over the summer? Okay. Yeah. So that's how I learned how news works Mm -hmm. because that is a whole thing Because they're two different things, right? Isn't like meteorology and and what you do explaining, uh, which I'll... I'll, Totally different. I want you to explain the models in a second, but like meteorology and then like just being in a studio and knowing the the cues and the way that a a broadcast works. When I started at my first job, I remember like my EP, my executive producer coming up to me. I had to fill in on the night shows and she was like, so there's a VOSOP before you and then we'll go to you. And I'm like, what the heck is a VOSOP? I don't know (laughs) what that means. Like VOSOP and package, it's a whole different Mm -hmm. lingo working in news. Mm -hmm. And you pick it up over time, but if you didn't study broadcasting, you have no idea what any of that is, Mm -hmm. and that would be me. Mm -hmm. So really, I think you learn the most at your first job. Mm -hmm. And when you graduated from college, from Rutgers, were you immediately hired in a station, or did you intern? Like, what happened after? Walk me through, like, after you graduated. So I graduated, I walked in graduation in the spring, but technically did not get my degree till the fall because I still had one class to finish that summer. Mm -hmm. So I did, I completed the class and I started applying, I think even before I got my degree in the mail, it really didn't matter because I graduated Mm -hmm. and I had all of, I had everything done. Mm -hmm. Um, It's really common for people to apply to a ton of jobs and still, and like have to wait a long time for something to work out. I was just kind of anxious in the fall to get out and start my career. Yeah. And so I applied to like a handful of jobs, like five jobs, mm-hmm. and they were literally anywhere. And in TV, it's a totem pole. You have to work your way up. Mm-hmm. So you start in a small market, a.k.a. small town, mm-hmm. and, you know, you just make the jump from one city to the next. Mm-hmm. And you typically go up in size into bigger cities. Mm -hmm. Well, I applied to Medford, Oregon, and I got a phone call. I don't remember how quickly, but it was pretty quick. Mm -hmm. And again, I had only applied to, like, a few jobs, and they Mm -hmm. called me back, um, and I took the job. But if I could do it again, I would not have gone that far. Oh, really? No, not in a million years. There are so many small markets in the Northeast, Mm -hmm. so many that there would be so many options. Mm-hmm. But I didn't know what I was doing. Yeah, and you wanted to know. say yes to an opportunity. And so... Yeah. so I went. Yeah. And um, I didn't love it, that's for sure. Mm-hmm. I was yeah. so happy to get out of there. Mm-hmm. I literally have nightmares that, I swear, I have nightmares <laughs> that I re-signed a contract <laughs> and I'm back in Oregon. Yeah, it's a different world. It's like a totally different world <laughs> out there. It's small town America, and Mm -hmm. there's nothing wrong with that, but for Mm -hmm. me, it's just not for me. Mm -hmm. You know, like, I'm from New Jersey. I'm used to, like, a very Mm fast-paced lifestyle Mm -hmm. and more of a city girl than a Mm -hmm. small town girl. So, I mean, I made the best of it. I tried to. Mm -hmm. 
And it was hard to leave because I had established friends and I was coaching cheerleading. Mm -hmm. It was hard to say bye. But at the same time, I was definitely ready to be back Mm -hmm. in the Northeast and closer Mm -hmm. to family. Yeah. So you moved back and now you're at CBS 6. Mm -hmm. And um, you are the, you started as the weekend meteorologist. And then now you are the morning weekday. weekday. Mm -hmm. Okay. Same thing happened at my first job too. Oh, really? Just kind of like get your foot in the door. Mm-hmm. And um, things worked out mm-hmm. at my last station and this station. Mm-hmm. I was just very yeah. fortunate. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So this is another thing that I find really interesting about being the weekday meteorologist is you go to work at 2 a.m. Is that right? Or earlier? Roughly 2 a.m. Yeah. So that's crazy. Like you yeah. are starting your day in the middle of the night when most people are going to sleep so TV walk me is through, an yeah. interesting industry mm-hmm. it's um you don't just walk in at like 10 minutes before your shift and there's like so many get on things camera, people right? don't realize mm-hmm. you need to have thick skin because people are always criticizing mm-hmm. especially with how social media yeah. is just like the way we run our lives mm-hmm. it's so easy for people to say anything they want mm-hmm. um you have to be willing to work holidays mm-hmm. and weekends and weird hours. But there's a lot of fields like that. Like if you work mm-hmm. in a hospital, mm-hmm. same thing for you. You're working mm-hmm. holidays and you're working weird shifts all the time. But um, you have to be willing to change your schedule. And I think the hardest thing in this industry is um, when you want to start a family. It's mm-hmm. hard just to date. No, yeah. Like think about it. If you want to do better in your – if you want to continue to climb the ladder mm-hmm. – you're picking up and moving every few years. So how mm-hmm. are you supposed to date someone? Mm-hmm. It's like, well, I really like you, but I'm moving, moving in a year. Yeah. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So it's hard to date. Yeah. Or when you have opposite schedules and you're going mm-hmm. into work in the middle of the night and like really the only time you can hang out with somebody is like on the weekends or like like you go to bed when most people are coming home from their day job. Yeah, I'm also not the person who rolls right out of bed and goes to work. I need like a little bit of time to yeah, like chill. Same. I shower and then I hang out with Ollie and eat breakfast, mm-hmm. watch TV. Mm-hmm. Like I'm not like just like sitting there watching TV for an hour, but I don't. Your routine. Yeah. So um, I I tend to get up around like twelve twelve thirty. Mm-hmm. So I used to go to bed like around three four. So I could get like a full night's sleep. Mm-hmm. But then over time, the longer you're on the schedule, um, I've I've switched over to the napping schedule, which mm-hmm. is quite common, especially for people who are married or mm-hmm. living with their significant mm-hmm. other. You go home and you nap for a few hours mm-hmm. eventually, and then you get up and go to bed a little later at night. So usually I go to bed around six ish. Oh, okay. But I do take a nap mm-hmm. most days, not every day. Mm-hmm. Um can you walk me through how you build your forecast because I find that really interesting you and I were just talking about the other day because I was just trying to wrap my head around it where most people they flip open their phone and then they see the weather they see like the temperature and maybe like a tiny cartoon of what the weather will be but like in your world that's like a blip on the radar, no pun intended. Yeah. But like, tell me how you build your forecast because I think it's so interesting. Yeah. So this is why you have to get in before the show because it's just me making the forecast. I'm not getting the forecast from anyone. So um, I come in and I look at all these different computer models, which sh- you know show me a graphical look at all these different parameters, temperature and wind speed and. Um, you know, forecast precipitation. And they basically show me a forecast going out anywhere from three to 10 days. All the models differ. And so you're looking at a graph of like different colors that represent the wind and the precipitation. Yeah. I mean, there's endless amounts of maps you could look at. Okay. I could look at the jet stream. I could look at yeah. what the winds are doing closer to the surface. Mm-hmm. Um, I can look at, I remember I showed you thickness mm-hmm. thicknesses. Um, how thick the atmosphere is between mm-hmm. 1,000 millibars and 500 millibars. Mm-hmm. If it's thicker, that means the air mass is warmer. And if it's more compressed, that means the air mass is cooler. Mm-hmm. So all those different things, we can look at that and compare the different computer models 
We can go with one computer model versus another. We can blend the forecast together with certain computer models. But the thing is, I make my own forecast. And these, these computers also will spit out a numerical forecast that allows me to see what the high temperature will be for today and the low for tonight, and it will go out the next seven mm -hmm. days. So that's where the actual numbers come from mm -hmm. on the seven-day forecast. And then those models get their information from balloons, right? So how are you? Yeah, how so is that? How is that data collected? Everybody knows about everybody the National has Weather Service access offices. to that, right? So not everybody can just like look up these computer models like you can. Yeah, so well, you can see the computer models on the National Weather Service website, but um, there's other compu like there's there's all different sources you can look at to view these models. I use a website that you need to have a subscription for. Mm -hmm. um, but basically, there's all these National Weather Service sites across the country, equally spaced out, and they have two weather balloons that go up. Mm -hmm. um, well, one weather balloon that goes up twice a day. Mm -hmm. And, um, and that's collecting information from yeah. our atmosphere. So it goes up and it collects all these different things like temperature, dew point, wind speed, wind direction. Which um, is something I had no idea existed. I really did. I just, I, in my mind, in my like brief understanding of what it, I was thinking that all this information was being collected by satellites, which is like so stupid, but like I didn't really understand that how this information is collected. And I told you those balloons, they go up and they'll eventually pop and then the little box with the balloon will float to the ground. Mm -hmm. And if you come across it, um, it will say, please mail back to the National Weather mm -hmm. Service and give you the address. Mm -hmm. It's pretty cool. That is really, really funny. But all of that data then is collected and put into these differential equations and um, all of the equations being different from model to mm -hmm. model. And they spit out a forecast from mm -hmm. that. So that's really how it works. So when you are doing a forecast and you're saying in your forecast, we're studying these models, we don't, or we're like studying a storm, that's what you're referring to is those models that you're studying that Yeah, helps often you we'll generate. say, let's say there's like a nor'easter this weekend um, and the computer models are not in agreement. Mm -hmm that's how you would word it. Mm -hmm. They're not necessarily agreeing. One of them wants mm -hmm. to take the storm off the coast. One of them wants it to hug the coastline. Mm -hmm. um, and it's usually not until closer to an event mm -hmm. that they come into better agreement. Because at that point, you know the history of the storm. Mm -hmm. At that point, you can see which model's uh, performing better than mm -hmm. the other. At that point, the storm is already formed, mm -hmm. so they're able to collect current data. Mm -hmm which makes it more accurate. All those things play a role. It is so interesting. Like, I really think they have such an interesting job because <laughs> it's not, it's not to me what, I feel like maybe some people listening might think it's just something like you just check weather.com and then create your, like, then just yeah. basically broadcast what it is. But it's actually, you study models, like back in your office, you have like radars going on and like behind us here, you can see different, things that are like being collected. And I just think that for people listening who don't understand what it is that you do, it's just so interesting. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of people, and I think again, this is because of social media, mm -hmm. nobody realized, I think everybody just thought we'd come in and we stand in front of the camera and mm -hmm. read things. Mm -hmm. First off, meteorologists don't read anything. It's just completely ad lib. Mm -hmm. You know, really? I'm looking at my maps and um, yeah, because talking over them. You don't. You probably don't need a teleprompter because you, you built well, the weather's that forecast. always changing. Yeah, and so I can't just that. write. Yeah, and, temperatures out. Right, but if you're looking at a map, you built that map, so you know how to. You know yeah. how to read it. Right. And, I mean, you. You know, I made the forecast, so I know what my show consists mm -hmm. of. I'm stacking my graphics in a certain order. Mm -hmm. It's all something I made. Whereas mm -hmm. if somebody else, like let's say I had an intern who was doing that all for mm -hmm. me. I would have to sit in front of the computer, just make sure I ran through everything a little bit so I'm familiar with what the forecast mm -hmm. is and mm -hmm. what I'm showing on air. But yeah, I look at the, I look at the um, camera and I see myself. I don't read anything. So what is a question that you get asked by people pretty often? Like what's a really common question that people ask you off the street or people like on social media? 
I mean, to be honest, it's it's funny because people are very familiar now with how TV works because of Facebook Live. Mm -hmm. That has drastically changed things. Really? People now understand the work that goes into it. Like, we come into work, my show doesn't start till 4.30, so I'm busy during beforehand making the forecast, updating graphics, I have to record some radio weather, do my hair and makeup. Mm -hmm. So people are familiar with that now. Most of the comments I get these days are about actually my clothes. Oh, really? Yeah. People always, people always Does ask, it bother you? No. Oh, no, okay. It's I love not it. like, okay. Everyone's like, you are the best dressed. Where do you get your clothes? Oh, cool. I get comments so from husbands all the time. So it's not like creepy things, like. No. Okay, People that's are good. great. The other thing is people. Like husbands will ask you where you get things so they can. Sometimes it's like, oh my gosh, my wife loved what you were wearing yesterday. Where did you get it? Oh, cool. I'd like to get it for her. Or I'd have husbands who are like, my wife and I watch you all the time. We love how you dress. That's cool. You know, just all yeah, really like genuine, nice, nice things. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, people are also thrown off by how small I am. Really? Yeah. Because when you're, you're on camera, mm-hmm. you can't really tell. Mm-hmm. They frame the shot so how you can't tell you? how small or, or tall I am. Mm-hmm. I'm only 5'1". Okay. And yeah. I weigh like 100 pounds. Yeah. <laughs> so that just mm-hmm. kind of like tells you I'm, mm-hmm. I'm pretty tiny. Mm-hmm. Um, I think the biggest thing is, though, people are very quick to just assume that, again, we're just like pretty faces standing in front of a camera and we don't mm-hmm. do anything. There's so much hard work that goes into news, and it mm-hmm. is constant, like, team effort. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's so much going mm-hmm. on. You know, news is always – there's always stuff happening. So mm-hmm. I will say, like, behind the scenes, in front of the cameras, like, everybody really does work mm-hmm. super hard. You mentioned team, like, because – it's not like a typical job where like you can call in sick like the last minute and then have somebody like you cover for you right like don't you have to have like yeah. the team you have to have a good uh. team around you because like i mean even today you're covering someone's noon shift and like the other day you were like somebody probably covered you so like mm-hmm. it takes a little bit more than like the typical job there's only four of us Mm -hmm. including me four meteorologists Mm -hmm. so if someone's sick Mm -hmm. someone else is filling in Mm -hmm. or if someone goes on vacation Mm -hmm. we're filling in so you do shows always shows shows are always happening Mm -hmm. um and uh, yeah if you are if you so it depends on your shift like if I worked the noon show and I woke up in the morning didn't feel well I could ask the morning meteorologist Mm -hmm. to stay and cover it Mm -hmm. And I can get someone to cover my shift too, but it'd have to be the day before. Mm-hmm. Like, let's say I work the morning shift tomorrow and I'm not feeling well and I might not feel well tomorrow. Mm-hmm. I can give a heads up to someone and say, hey, can you cover yeah. for me tomorrow? I'm going to yeah. call in. Mm-hmm. But I can't wake up at midnight and be like, oh gosh, I'm mm-hmm. throwing up. Mm-hmm. Can you? Can't call in mm-hmm. because everyone's sleeping or my, you know, my supervisor, my um, chief meteorologist is going to bed mm-hmm. and just work the whole night. Mm-hmm. So, You're stuck going in. Mm -hmm. And that's the case for an anchor, too, who works a morning shift, but only if they solo anchor. Okay. You know? Mm -hmm. So if if they anchor with someone else, they can call in because Mm -hmm. the other person can can just anchor the show by themselves. That's cool. Um, I remember a conversation we had, and hopefully this doesn't happen as much anymore, but I remember when you and I were talking a little while ago, you were saying when you first started in broadcast meteorology that you would get comments from people men that didn't want to hear the weather from oh you know know what's okay so that actually that was not until this job really there were no issues at my first job when I came here and you know there's there's three other stations here there's Mm -hmm. there's the ABC affiliate NBC affiliate and there's spectrum Mm -hmm. this is the CBS affiliate well it was predominantly male the only other female that did the weather here was Heather Morrison on Spectrum, and she's wonderful. Um, she was the only female when I started here mm-hmm. on weekends. And at that time, I was just doing weekend weather and mm-hmm. filling in during the week. And we had a couple people call the newsroom, and believe it or not, it was a woman the one time. I don't know about the other time, but she said, That's why is there a female doing the weather? I'm used to always being a man. And it was just wild that someone would have that reaction. And now, here we are. So this month, I've been here four years now. Mm -hmm. And um, 
Heather Morrison is now on weekday mornings, so she is on when I'm on. And we also have Jess Briganti, who is on 10 in the morning. So now three of the four stations have females on in a prime time slot, weekday morning. And there's also a couple other females. Mm -hmm. But still, like a very few amount of women doing weather. Which is the case with STEM in general. You know, Mm -hmm. there's just not a lot of women. It's predominantly male. Um, But hopefully that changes. I think it is changing. It's going in the right direction. Yeah, I think so. And I'm just surprised that I didn't realize it was a woman that called and complained. Like that's that I know for sure. That's very like disappointing for to hear because you would hope that as another female you'd be in support of a woman in a role that's like really predominantly men across the board, right? Isn't I mean I'm sure in your classes in school there weren't a lot of women in the there meteorology. Were, though. Oh really? There were for me. Really? I mean I don't know what the actual stat is. I'd be curious to know like broadcast meteorology what percentage is male versus female i'm not sure um because i never really totally noticed that it was predominantly male i mean i always saw females like i grew up watching the weather channel um but when i came here that's why i was so shocked i'm like how are there no females in this market because this is not like small town america this is a Mm -hmm. decent size you know we're not in a huge city but Mm -hmm. it's not small yeah the only female meteorologist that i can think of off the top of my head is ginger z and mm-hmm. she's, I think well, she's Dylan on. Well, there's Dylan Dreyer. Oh, He's Dylan. On the Today That's show. right. That's right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But so. Ginger's chief. Mm-hmm. Oh, is she? So she, mm-hmm. she used to be, was Sam champion, mm-hmm. and then Sam left mm-hmm. and went to the Weather Channel, mm-hmm. and then Ginger Z went to mm-hmm. chief meteorologist mm-hmm. for ABC. That's cool. So it's amazing, you know, mm-hmm. that, she, that they, you know, main network mm-hmm. has a female mm-hmm. in a position like that. Yeah. Cool. Where where do you see yourself in like the next like five to ten years? Um, I think this is just you know a stepping stone for me. I love the capital region. Mm-hmm. I do. I really do. Like I did not like Oregon at all, but I love this area. Mm-hmm. Um, I just feel like if I don't try taking that next step in my career, and the only next step, like mm-hmm. I don't plan on doing anything more than that. I just always saw myself being in a bigger city, and mm-hmm. I feel like I need to do that before I can really settle down. Mm-hmm. Otherwise, I feel like I'll never be able to feel content, Yeah, if that makes sense. That makes sense. So I do see myself. I will always stay in the Northeast. Mm-hmm. I love the weather of the Northeast, and I will never leave. Mm-hmm. I love the four seasons. The weather is interesting everywhere. What's your favorite weather? I don't know if I have a favorite weather. Which is weird, because I feel like probably most meteorologists do, but I enjoy it all. What were the seven weather weather patterns that, like, the one that's always forgotten? Remember? Precipitation? Yeah, the seven, yeah seven different precipitations. So there's, there's rain, snow, hail, sleet, freezing rain, grapple. Grapple. <laughs> That was the one that I completely. Is there I another like, one? What I don't know. I Maybe it was just six. You would know better than me. But I was like, grapple. Like, I have to write it down and like stare what at is paper grapple? and see what like, I'm missing. Like I've never even like you don't you don't hear like we're, today we're gonna have a large mix of grapple. Yeah, there's all different processes. <laughs> yeah. You know, it has to do with um, you know, like people get confused how we get hail in the summertime. Oh, okay. But it comes from a thunderstorm. And they have these downdrafts of very cold air, but then it goes up again before coming down. So in the process, you have water that's freezing, Mm -hmm. you know, that eventually makes its way to the ground. Mm -hmm. It's kind of confusing, but it's easy to look at a graph and understand it. Mm -hmm. That's really cool. Just hearing, just knowing the the explanation behind it. Mm -hmm. Um, What do you typically do for lunch? Because I know you don't have a, like, you get here at, you know, 2, and then you, like, you, you're you done at, like, 9, 9.30. So if you're not doing the, if you're not filling in for someone during the noontime show, you don't really have a typical lunch break. So what, yeah. how do you, like? Well, I don't have a lunch break at all. I, so I'm on air from 4.30 to, we're in show, 4.30 to 8. Mm-hmm. And then I still have two different short live things to do during the eight to nine o'clock hour, which is usually when I'll start eating something. Mm -hmm. 
I eat during the whole show, but just snacks. Mm -hmm. Because it's not like I can sit here eating spaghetti during the show or something, you know? (laughs) Why not? Or even a sandwich. (laughs) And it's funny, once you start eating, the way your body digests can make it hard to read. Like for me, or just talk. My one co-anchor doesn't really eat during the show because she always says that, like, she always has, like, um, saliva and stuff in her oh. mouth that makes it hard to talk. Mm-hmm. You constantly, like, have to swallow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For me, like, when I eat, the way I guess my body digests, I'm always, like, burping. Oh, okay. Yeah, like, not, like, obnoxious, all. loud burps, mm-hmm. but just kind of, like, you know, it's just the way my yeah. body digests. So mm-hmm. sometimes I'll have to, like, take a pause in between talking mm-hmm. to um, let the air out. Yeah, but I kind of burp in, so you can't hear it on my <laughs> mic. <laughs> I know that's so like it's kind of awkward but awkward because like in, I have in, to eat yeah yeah you have so to. I have to do it cool but yeah well, I don't know I eat cereal every day before work and then I snack on things during the show like yogurt or mm-hmm. vegetables mm-hmm. Um, or fruit granola bars and then sometimes I'll bring food with me and eat mm-hmm. that during the eight to nine o'clock hour either real food or something from the mm-hmm. microwave the freezer yeah. Random things. Yeah. Um, so as we're wrapping up, where can people find you on social media? Or do you have, like, if somebody wants to ask a follow-up weather question or, like, they really were inspired by what they heard here today, tell us how we can get a hold of you. Well, I'm on Facebook and Twitter. I have pages um, there and then also Instagram. And really, you should find my page if you just search Alyssa Carapriest. Okay. I do also have a website, okay. and that's literally just alyssacarapriest.com. Mm-hmm. And on there, but on your my most... website, will have my social media stuff, too. Okay. You're most active on Facebook, though. Is that correct? Because you do I a lot of live. I post to Facebook and Twitter every day. Mm-hmm. Okay. I so have to for work. At... Everyone has to okay. if you work in news these days. Yeah. But, yeah, I mean, I'm, um, I'm always on both of them. Okay. So at, on Twitter, it's at Alyssa Carol Priest. On Twitter, it's CBS Six Alyssa. Okay. I believe that's my handle. And Facebook is facebook.com slash meteorologist Alyssa Carol Priest. Okay, cool. We have show notes in this podcast, so I'll link everything in the show notes if people want to find you and follow you. Okay. Thank cool. you for joining me, Alyssa. Yes, thank you. That was meteorologist Alyssa Carolpreece. You can catch Alyssa on weekday mornings as early as 4.30 a.m. on the CBS 6 Albany station. That's our show for today. Thank you so much for listening. You can follow us on Instagram and like us on Facebook. We're at Working Lunch Pod. Also, please subscribe and leave us a review. If there's someone who you would like to be featured as a guest here on Working Lunch, email us at workinglunchpod at gmail.com. We'd love to hear from you. Thank you so much for listening to Working Lunch. And remember, your biggest strength is who you are.